We've been told time and again that those who don't learn from history are doomed to repeat it. And as my next guest suggests, those who do learn repeat it anyway. And that's the cycle journalist and professor Jelani Cobb is hoping to end by reintroducing a 1968 landmark study on race, inequality, and police violence, which is just as relevant today as it was 53 years ago. The Kerner Commission was tasked by President Lyndon Johnson with determining the root causes of deadly uprising sparked by racial unrest in Newark, Detroit, and other cities. And the report didn't waste time with equivocation, warning, our nation is moving toward two societies, one black, one white, separate and unequal. Further, the report determined, police are not merely the spark, then Cobb continued, they are part of the broader set of institutional relationships that enforce and recreate racial inequality. Problem is never simply the incident, but the facts and factors that made such an incident possible, even predictable. The Commission's many recommendations were ignored, including by the President who commissioned them, with the findings released just weeks before the assassination of Reverend King and mere months before Richard Nixon was elected on his Law and Order campaign. So today, against the backdrop of protests and uprising following the killings of George Floyd, Ahmaud Arbery, Breonna Taylor, Freddie Gray, Tamir Rice, Trayvon Martin, and so many more black Americans, and with many Republicans still embracing Nixon's mantra, Cobb has published key findings from the decades-old effort in the essential Kerner Commission report. Jelani Cobb, staff writer with The New Yorker and professor Columbia Journalism School joins me now. He's also the executive producer of the three-part HBO documentary, Obama, in pursuit of a more perfect union. Jelani, welcome, and I'm embarrassed to say how much I learned from your book. Oh, oh thank you. Thank you. You know, the major recommendations of the Kerner Commission, and I should say, whose membership included the one United States, the black United States senator at the time, Ed Brooke from Massachusetts, right. went right. well beyond mm -hmm policing. Could you summarize the areas the recommendations touched upon? Sure. Um, you know, first, thank you for having me. But, you know, I, I think that Pleasure. when we look at Kerner and its relevance, the most obvious point of it is in establishing that the incident that happens uh, is not the sole uh, genesis of the problem. And so they looked at housing, you know, not simply police relations. They looked at housing. They looked at employment and more specifically unemployment. Uh, they looked at uh, health care and the absence of uh, access to health care. They looked at the quality of education uh, or the absence thereof uh, in these communities. And they also looked, interestingly enough, at media uh, and a very prescient examination of the role that media played uh, in the frustrations that people had in these communities. Uh, and so it was really a very exhaustive examination of the problems surrounding uh, these, as, as they call them in very antiseptic language, uh, these civil disturbances. You know, and also I think people may surprise when they did address uh, police behavior, uh, they did, obviously the word defunding police was not part of it, but shifting resources to non-traditional police functions that's being debated today was also part of Kerner, the Kerner work, was it not? That's so fascinating, yes, because, you know, we've heard the, the slogan, uh, defund the police, which I think uh, was tended to, to conjure ideas that were a little bit distinct uh, from what people were actually advocating. Uh, but when you go back to 1968 and this report, one of the things they say is that, you know, there's a problem, and they call it, they use the word ghetto, which is not a word we would use now, but uh, they said there's a problem in the ghetto and that law enforcement are called for a whole array of social concerns that actually have nothing to do with the enforcement of the law. Uh, and what this does is create just simply more points of contact uh, between the average civilian and the average law enforcement officer um, with the potential of something going wrong each time and something potentially going disastrously wrong each time. And so what they said was that there needed to be other social service uh, organizations or outlets that could address concerns that didn't require someone with a gun to show up. Uh, and in a very succinct way, they were uh, encapsulating the idea that has been uh, come to be known as defund the police now. Oh. You know, excuse the and siren, as you can tell, I'm actually here in New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> it's fine. We have those here too, by the way. You know, using mm -hmm. uh, uh, the term that is used there, as you say, not in uh, usage now, ghetto, what do they say about white America's responsibility for the conditions under which black America was forced to live in what they called the ghetto, Jelani? Yeah, it's, it's astounding. You know, when you think about government reports, uh, which tend to be, you know, very bland, uh, and, you know, they kind of bury their conclusions in ambivalent language. But the Carter report was nothing like that. Uh, they say, you know, very bluntly that the ghetto is a creation of white America uh, and that uh, what white people have forgotten, but the Negro can never forget, uh, is that the ghetto exists only uh, because they condone it uh, and they allow it to. Uh, and so it's a it's a kind of moral indictment that you wouldn't anticipate. Certainly, LBJ did not anticipate uh, something like that when he commissioned uh, this group uh, to get to the bottom of what was happening, and that explains one of the reasons why the report was so unpopular when it when it came out. At least in government and official channels, it was. Did you when you worked as intimately with the document as as you did, and maybe even before, because I know you're an historian as well, did you mm -hmm. not get the feelings that it was laying out a formula for reparations? Again, not using the term, but that's what I came away with after reading mm -hmm. your edits in the book. Is that a fair assessment? Yeah, I mean, I think that you could say that. You know, they wouldn't say that specifically, but what they talk about is redress. And, you know, they say that there has to be something done uh, to make whole uh, these communities that have suffered as a result of discrimination. Uh, and, uh, and, and yeah, that's kind of the brief that they put forward. Uh, and as you mentioned, of course, th this couldn't have come at a worse time, politically speaking. Uh, the, uh, the country was about to lurch in a very different direction. Uh, and and it's just a kind of irony, I suppose, of us having this conversation with so many police sirens going by. Um, but uh, I think that, uh, you know, when we look at what happened in 1968 and the election of Richard Nixon and the success of the law and order appeals and, and so on, uh, that this report was really kind of orphaned uh, and uh, was, was left uh, to be a kind of a finger pointing in a direction that we never pursued. Uh, but, but yeah, that would be, it's in the vein of the conversation we're having now about reparations. You know, in the spirit of, uh, if you change the name, the place, and the dates uh, they're talking about now, here's ta Coates in your documentary, Obama, in pursuit of a more mm -hmm. perfect union. Obama, um, I think, gets a lot of flack from the perspective of the presidency, first black presidency only being symbolic. But, you know, as I argue, I think people underrate the value of symbols. I think the way Obama conducted himself in terms of specifically his relationship with black culture hey, brother. communicated a totally different symbol to other people. And I think one of the great mistakes was we forgot that. We forgot that there were other people, you know, who, who were watching. And some of those watching were unhappy about the changing demographics, thus came sure. Trump, which is sort of analogous, I think you'd agree, to then came Richard Nixon to address the anxiety and anger that whites felt after the Kerner Commission report, no? Sure. I mean, it was the politics of backlash each time. Uh, and, you know, kind of more broadly, you know, there was everything that was going on in 1967, 1968. But it was really the uh, uh, the drive and the success of the civil rights movement that people were pushing back against. Uh, and we saw that in Nixon and the, the Nixonian tilt of American politics. Uh, the same sort of thing, you know, I mean, obviously, it's not an exact analogy, but, you know, close enough that, you know, we see parallels in what happened in 2016. Uh, and, you know, Obama, just in what he embodied, uh, represented a particular kind of success, a particular kind of progress uh, based upon the civil rights movement. And, you know, Donald Trump was the antithesis of that. We only have a minute left, but going back to Santayana for a moment, any reason to think, mm -hmm. Jelani, that, that we won't still be repeating history 53 years from now as we've repeated it 53 years after the Kerner Commission? I think we very well could, uh, but I also think that every bit of progress that we have made in the society, and we have made some progress, has occurred because people eventually got the point. 
uh, and it becomes a matter of simply repeating and reiterating uh, and continuing uh, until we actually get over the hurdle and are, are able to move forward in some way. Let me tell you, the essential Kerner Commission report is essential. Thanks for doing it, and thanks for Thank the tutorial. Mm -hmm. it, really, uh, it really is huge. Thank you. Be well. You too.